In the last few years, you might have seen people blaming this fish for their shortcomings and responsibilities, or explaining they rue the day this fish decided to beach itself permanently. How could you have done this? This is Tiktaalik, also known as the true transitional fossil between fish and water, and tetrapods on land. The ancestor to amphibians and reptiles, birds and mammals, and eventually us. While I am gonna give you some more context on whether or not you should blame this fish for your existence, this video is much more than that. Tiktaalik and the transition to land is cool on its own, yeah, but the story of its discovery is even cooler. I would actually consider it one of the top three coolest things I learned about in college. So today I'm gonna share this story with you. I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of the transition, break down the discovery, and introduce you to Tiktaalik, the transitional fossil that changed everything. Let's start off with some context on this transition to land. If you're familiar with some of the major concepts of evolution, or even better, have been watching my History of Life on Earth series, you'll know that animals on land have not always been animals on land. All life on Earth started in the water billions of years ago, and then became more complex, evolved and diversified, and became more complex, evolved, and diversified over and over and over again under the pressures of competition and predation and etc. And inevitably, shit spread out, taking over the seemingly untouched habitats that would provide more safety from the chaos. And for every major group, at one point or another, this unexplored habitat was land. Fungi and plants made their way out of the water first, and then sometime like 390 million years ago, the vertebrates, i.e. fish, started dipping their toes in, or I guess out, started dipping their toes out, because they were already in. Also, they didn't have toes. That was just a shitty metaphor. And this is not to say that one spring morning 390 million years ago, a fish hauled itself onto land and stayed there. It would have just died just like any other beached fish alive today. It means that scientists have found fossils in rocks that date to about 390 million years ago that show the earliest signs to this transitional land, and later fossils with more developed traits that signal this evolution moving further and further in the land direction. These are traits like developed limbs for locomotion, necks. Fish don't have necks. And it just so happens that these transitional fossils initially developed bladder skulls with their eyes situated at the top of their head. It's thought that these fish were spending more and more time in shallow waters and these top head eyes helped them spot creatures from above the water line. Obviously a lot more went into the transition of lands like structurally and physiologically. It was quite a fucking leap. I talked about the development of lungs in the Devonian video last week that you can check out here if that interests you, but I wanna stop there and keep it simple for the sake of keeping it simple. So long story short, there is a fossil record of the fish to tetrapod gradient, each with a more developed mix of traits that would eventually lead to the first vertebrates living fully on land. And this transition took place over like 80 million years. So a long fucking time. Let me introduce you to some of these notable transitional species real quick. Starting off with a more primitive form, Eusthenopteron, extremely fish. They were a type of lobed fin fish alive during the late Devonian that at first glance seemed like nothing special, but their lobed fins had tiny little bones that correspond to the bones we know and love in our arms and legs today. Your femur, your humerus, your radius and ulna, the tibia, the fibula, all the shit you haven't thought about since ninth grade biology. These contributed to very powerful fins, which is literally what their name translates to powerful fins. But as far as we know, these fins were powerful in the water only. It doesn't seem like they spent any time on land, despite having lungs to breathe air, along with gills like today's lungfish. Next, Pandrichthys, another lobe finned fish that seems to have even more developed limb bones, tiny little elements that correspond to today's fingers. You couldn't see them with the naked eye. These were, of course, inside the fin, but shit was kicking inside the fin. Their head was more flat, and their eyes were situated higher up on the skull. And their tail was moving more in the direction of what we know from early tetrapods. It seems as though stumbling onto land for short bursts could have been possible for this fish and others like it. Maybe to reach other bodies of water in their shallow water environments, you know, when like shit dried up. Now we're gonna jump to the other side of the transition, on their way to fully tetrapods. First, Acanthostega, as you can see, four pretty developed limbs. The vision was definitely there, but they weren't necessarily strong enough to fully support them on land. Short bursts, yes, but still very much at home in the water. And next, Ichthyostega, more robust limbs to support their weight on land and to pull themselves out of the water. They also had a pretty deep rib cage for better air breathing support and seemingly visible tiny fingers that served less use in the water. Seems as though they would have relied more on their tail fin for moving through shallow swamps. All right, so we've got some fossils on the fishy side and some fossils on the limmy side. This is essentially what paleontologist Neil Shubin saw on a slide in a presentation in grad school. These transitional fossils had a noticeable gap between them, the true intermediate, the true half and half. The link was missing and Neil set out to find it. Ah, uh, there's a cat pulling on the door handle to come in. Hi buddy, you wanna come say hi? One of the perks of moving to a new place is uh, having a new cat to hang out with. Happy, happy. Okay. <laughs> 
Sequoia is still here too, just so you know. They uh, chase each other around a bit. When it comes to finding fossils, you have a couple things you have to consider. You can't just go digging in the local park and manifest finding a T-Rex bone. Certain areas around the world have certain conditions for fossils of certain ages. Plate tectonics has shifted shit around for millions of years. So now you can expect to find fossils from the age of the dinosaurs in Montana or fossils from the Cambrian in parts of the Canadian Rockies, etc. And even more specific than that, you can find fossils in what would have been a shallow sea a hundred million years ago in a certain area. There are known areas with rocks dated to certain ages. So luckily you have a good starting point. There are a couple known places around the world that have Devonian age rocks that more specifically correspond to wetland type environments. The first and easier place to look was Pennsylvania. Neil, along with his friend Ted and the rest of their team spent some time following around construction crews that were building new roads and shit in hopes of finding fossils in the ground when the construction crew dug it up, which did end up being successful. But the fossils they found were early tetrapods that dated to 365 million years ago, i.e. not old enough. They didn't need tetrapods, they needed the half and half. So the team had to regroup. They decided they wanted to look for fossils that were 15 million years older than those they found in Pennsylvania. And it just so happened that at that time, there was an area of the world with rocks of exactly that age that had not really been explored at all yet. What kind of place would, at this point in the 90s, still be unexplored to paleontologists? Take a guess. Must be some sort of vicious landscape that scientists are purposely avoiding at all costs. Yeah the Arctic, the last unexplored location that just so happened to have rocks of the right age, right location, and exposed at the surface, just so happened to be in the fucking Canadian Arctic. Luckily, Ted and Neil, determined to find this missing link, were willing to take on the challenge, or challenges multiple. Obviously, it was cold as shit and also isolated as shit, which means all the resources they needed while they were there had a very complex route to take to get to them, and it was just completely inhospitable. They had to make everything they used and everything they found and got sent back to the labs absolutely 100% worth it to make sure they weren't wasting a ton of resources, time, and money. They spent not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six years doing on and off expeditions all over the Arctic. It was the trial and error of plenty of fossil hunts, of finding fossils, but not the right ones in the right location, readjusting and trying again, but at the fucking North Pole. The amount of passion and dedication required to continue going back there year after year, not finding what you're looking for for so long, dude, I, I can't even imagine that. I lasted six months in Minnesota and I was out. But each expedition came with a more refined understanding of where to look next. This was definitely very helpful, but also very expensive. And they were running out of money. They decided their trip in 2004 was gonna be their last one. So everything was on the line. They had spent all this money going back and forth, getting resources there through a complex supply chain, and they hadn't found what they were looking for. But then, on one of these days during the 2004 expedition, they came across a little V notch in the rock, the snout of a flat-headed fish. Oh shit, a good sign. In that same general area, they found a couple more. They brought these fossils back to the labs and preparators carefully chipped away at the rocks surrounding them for months and revealed they had found a flat-headed fish with eyes situated at the top of their head, a neck, but also fins with fin rays and bones inside that match the prerequisites found in the fins of the fishy tetrapod ancestors. Boom, they fucking did it. They predicted exactly what this missing link was gonna look like. They predicted what location they were gonna find it in. And they predicted the age of the rocks that it was gonna be situated in. And after years of looking for it, on their final trip, they fucking found it. Dude, that, Whoa. Science is just so fucking cool. They named it Tiktolic rosier, with the genus name meaning large freshwater fish, and rosier to honor one of the donors who, from my understanding, helped fund the expeditions. Tiktolic got to somewhere between four to nine feet long and had pretty gnarly teeth, so they definitely seemed to be a predator. Like I mentioned, they had flat skulls with eyes situated on the top of their head rather than the sides. They seemed to have had both gills and lungs, like many of the other. Jesus Christ, Odie, he's freaking me out. I keep thinking somebody's in here. And they seem to have both gills and lungs like many of the other transitional species. Their fins seem to have been strong enough to prop them up for short bursts, a bit stronger than those of Pandrichthys, but like those earlier forms, still spent most of their time in the water. While Neil and his team were able to predict the existence of Tiktaalik based on the transitional form surrounding it, that is not at all to say that Tiktaalik in life existed as a transitional fossil. It's not how it works. Tiktaalik was really well adapted for the environment it existed in 375 million years ago. That's all there was to it at that time. Just like any individual of any species alive today, they existed to exist and as a product of their ancestors before them. We just so happen to now know 375 million years years later, that Tiktaalik's relatives and their descendants spent more and more time on land, little by little, generation by generation, over millions of years, and eventually, unknowingly, evolved into amphibians, reptiles, dinosaurs, birds, mammals, and eventually humans who developed the brain capacity to discover them. And maybe one day, 
375 million years into the future. An intelligent life form will be looking at the fossil of a creature alive today as their own monumental transitional form. And what exactly that creature was doing on a day like today will not be as significant to them. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my next long form video coming out next week. Check out my Patreon for behind the scenes content and our Discord server. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya! Odie, stop pulling on the door handle, buddy. Please, get through it right now. God, he's a maniac. He's crazy. He plays fetch like a dog.